We woke up this morning to a most glorious frost and some of our plants were still in bloom and got frosted over. And I personally aimed to get this video out earlier, but I didn't really get to it. But I really wanted to highlight 30 or so of our flowers that remained in bloom through October and in some cases even into November. So now that it's mid-November when I'm filming this, most of our flowering plants in the gardens have started to go to seed. And that's really great to see because we leave the majority of our seed heads up because it provides a good food source for our overwintering birds and wildlife. And I just saw some very high-spirited juncos this morning feasting on the seed heads of the echinacea and the liatris and even a cardinal that landed on the verbena seed heads and was eating that. Additionally, if you think about it, the sturdy hollow stems of some of our plants also provide an overwintering spot for native bees as well. And the fallen leaves or the duff layer will provide an insulative layer for the overwintering caterpillars, for instance. So these are just some things to think about when you're considering maintaining your landscape. Sometimes it's not great to remove all of that because a lot of organisms will use that as a place to hibernate or overwinter or eat. Now, historically frost dates in our areas were late September, but we've had more of a prolonged fall year over year and the first light frost we had was only in late October, so really a month later than typically expected. Now, between these later frosts and the fact that many of our gardens that we have planned um, and that, put, that we have put in are approaching, I would say, roughly two years old now, that's given us an opportunity to see what flowers we've planted are the latest season bloomers. So I thought I would spend the next number of minutes or so going over around 30 plants that have reliably bloomed through October this year and even pushed into early November. Now this is a nice list to keep handy because these late season blooms can both provide a solid pollinator source for pollinating insects as well as colors into late fall when it's normally starting to get pretty drab in the landscape. Now keep in mind, we're bordering on the grow zones of five and six, and we have a lot of microclimates on this land given the elevation changes and depending on what aspect, so north, south, east, or west, and also we've had a warmer fall this year, so these bloom times may change year over year. All right, so let's begin. First up, are the asters. And we have a variety of aster species and cultivars that are on the market and provide quite an array of the end of season blooms, many of them throughout November even. So on sunny days, they are often drenched in pollinators, ranging from bees to wasps to flies. The second on my list are Japanese anemones. And we have two cultivars in our pollinator garden, including anemone September charm and fall in love sweetly. You know, the ones with like double blooms, I would say, I would encourage you to not source those and source more single bloom varieties because that's what the pollinators prefer. Those double blooms, it's really hard for the pollinator to get to the nectar or the pollen source. And the single blooms, they usually have that disc that's really opened that allows for uh, bees and flies and wasps to get at it. And uh, bumblebees on the Japanese anemones I'll mention will do this buzz pollination on the flowers. So they'll go zzzz really audibly. And that's really a joy to listen to. Helenium or sneezeweed is up next. And I have two species of sneezeweed, common and purple-headed sneezeweed, and they are really tall plants. And that really serves as a beacon for pollinators. And I'd say that they hit their bloom peak uh, probably around late September and then into early October. And then they start to look a little worse for wear as November is upon us. But we still had blooms of sneezeweed in November as well. 
goldenrod, which is in the genus uh, Solidago. You also have goldenrod in Euthamia and Oligonuron, I believe. These are plants that go stem and stem with asters. And what I mean is that when you look at a meadow, it's usually goldenrod and asters out here. And uh, I mentioned the asters earlier, and that also comes in a variety of uh, different genera. Symphiotrichum is the one that I think of the most. Um, but we have quite a variety of goldenrod throughout the uh, meadow, so the natural spaces, and also through our gardens. And they really host a variety of insects, ranging from bees and flies and wasps, also non-pollinating insects, like you, know, you see crab spiders, you'll also often see like plant bugs, or assassin bugs or anything along those lines. So goldenrods really serve as a, a microhabitat for a lot of different types of insects. The next on my list is willow-leaved sunflower, which is a helianthus, and it is surprisingly a strong bloomer through the frost even. And that was shocking to me because it really hit its stride in late October and was blooming through November. Now I didn't see as many pollinators on the sunflower and I'm not sure why it actually bloomed so late because I can't remember it blooming that late last year. It could have very well been. My, my mind, you know, with all the flowers, it could be a little bit foggy, but that one was a big surprise for me. So I planted uh, agrimony in our herb garden and these get like a little lizard tail style yellow inflorescence and they're very lovely, whimsical flowers that bloom late and they keep the pollinators busy. And we have a, a native agrimony, but I haven't seen it in the market, haven't been able to actually source it. Maybe I'll be able to find some seeds and start from, from some seeds. They're typically found in like wetter areas, so I'd probably plant that around some of the pond areas. But that one has a very similar style inflorescence, it's yellow and it tends to attract a lot of pollinators, even though the little flowers are quite tiny. Pycnanthemum is a mountain mint, and it's a wonderful native plant that is usually drenched in pollinators throughout a three month period. And the different species of mountain mints seem to bloom at slightly different times, and that provides a reliable source for our insects. So even on the same plant, you'll see a plant maybe blooming in September, and then that same plant will be blooming again in November, but maybe a different part of the plant. So that was something that was um, interesting to observe. And I will say that like Pycnanthum muticum, for instance, it's considered, I think, a rare plant in New York, which is kind of strange to think about because like mints tend to spread and very easily. And it's also now a popular plant in meadow restorations or turning your lawns into meadows. Um, and there's a couple others that uh, of the Pycnanthemum uh, species that are either rare or threatened or endangered. And it could just be like habitat loss because we used to have more open spaces when let's say the indigenous people were here and they were um, uh, burning some acreage in order to have open spaces because these are flowers that typically would not grow in like woodlands, for instance, they'd grow in more open areas. So that's really lovely to be able to grow because it does spread, so give it space, and you would want to plant it in a place that's either, you could either restrict it or you'd, you could let it spread. Because if, if you have it like, let's say in a raised bed, then it will be restricted more because it spreads more rhizomatously. And it also is a really good seeder. So I had some of our Pycnanthemum tenifolium, uh, which has thinner leaves, but really beautiful blooms, similar to other Pycnanthemums. And it hopped over into our shrubbery garden. So it's, and I've just let it kind of spread willy-nilly there because the pollinators seem to really love it. All right, next up is Anis hyssop, and this is Agastache funiculum. And there are all sorts of different cultivated varieties of this plant. And I find this to be so wonderfully sweetly scented. And I did plant it in the herb garden, but like some of the pycnanthemum, it decided that it didn't want to uh, be there. And it started to seed in the shrubbery, which I totally allowed. And it served as a really strong pollinator plant even through November. Now I have cultivated a variety of obedient plants. This is Physostegia virginiana, call, and this one is called Vivid. And it's sometimes the, uh, sometimes the cultivated varieties are no interest to pollinators, but that really doesn't seem to be the case for this cultivar. 
And we have the straight species growing around the Half Lake area too, which has this really pale cream whitish pink color. And this one is more vivid, hence the name. And I love how the bumblebees, they just disappear down the flower's throat and they're in there for like a minute and you're like, where did they go? And then they start to back their little fuzzy butts out. So it's, uh, it's really a delight to see. So a non-native flower, but one that is so iconic in the garden is Verbena bonariensis or purple top vervain. Now, I didn't think it was hardy to our zone 5-6, but this year, because we had a, the last winter was very light, I noticed some of them cropped up again and it does have a tendency to recede itself. And it has re-emerged every year. And um, just like some of our other verbena, I will mention that our verbena homestead purple, which is based off of one of our uh, native verbenas, verbena canadensis, is an incredible bloomer. And it's one of those flowers that have bloomed throughout November, even past the frost. So uh, I think verbena in general is a really good late bloomer, but I love verbena bonariensis and it is a pollinator magnet and it particularly is a late season favorite for butterflies. And because it's so tall and stately within the garden, it really serves as that beacon as a butterfly landing. So another reddish purple flower, which is a late season bloomer that happens to be a native plant is ironweed or vernonia. And there are quite a bit of cultivars and they seem to be a wonderful pollinator source late in the season. And I had ours in our pollinator garden blooming through November. One thing I will notice about, uh, note about Vernonia is that it tends to be a very robust plant after a number of years of planting. And so you just wanna give it the space or you could try to find a cultivar that is a bit more of a compact version. Now, a few flowers are true blue, but I would argue that the Ceratostigma plumb plumbaginoides or hardy plumbago falls into that category. It gets this late season blue flower through November and it its leaf starts to redden up as well. And that really makes it an attractive bedding plant. And bees are constantly seeking out its pollinator sources. So that is one that I had planted in the front of the common house and I, it was just a delight to see the bees going from one flower to the next. Now another favorite of mine is Bampton, Bampton Vervain and I mentioned some of the verbena in the past. Um, this is non-native and I didn't know if it would be hardy to our zone but not only is it hardy it has such a fun form and so many dainty little flowers that the insects love. And I didn't even know it would have this kind of really, um, you know, kind of uh, puffy form to it because in the first year that you plant it, it's a bit scraggly. And on the, by the time the second year rolls around, it is just this total round ball filled with all these dainty little purple flowers. And it doesn't matter how small the little flowers are because there's so many of them that it really attracts pollinators. And I think that it's just a really delight to see in the garden, but give it space because I was surprised at how much it actually fills out. All right, next up on the list is Kaluna or Heathers, which I did a whole video about earlier in the season. And it's an ericaceous plant like a blueberry, and it has these little dainty, creamy white flowers. Most of them are white, some of them are pink and things along those lines. And that will be a pollen source through November and even into December, surprisingly, for any insects that happen to be out there on a warm day. Catmint is a no-brainer in a pollinator garden, and they typically fit into two genera. So you have Calamintha and you have Nepeta. And some of these cultivars or these species are more purple, whereas some are whiter. And I've seen pollinators on both. And it's plausible to think that the white one may actually attract more moths at night or any pollinating insects at night, but I'm usually not up to confirm that assumption. But that's something to think about because some of those white flowers are actually beacons at night, particularly on a very well-lit evening when the, the moon is out, and then you have that reflection on some of the white flowers below. Okay, so the next one on my list is Guara or Onothera linmerii, and it's a graceful plant I think it's often called whirling butterflies. 
There's lots of different cultivars that range from like this raspberries to uh, soft pinks to whites. And I've noticed that the pollinators tend to gravi gravitate a bit more to the white one. And we do also have a native called Onothera biennis, and that one tends to be much larger and it does attract a lot of pollinators. But at least from what I saw from this season, it didn't really push too much out into September. And it was the Onothera linmarii that actually pushed out more into November. And so that's the one I would suggest if you want maybe a, a later bloom. So I'm not sure if it'll always be this way, but the Tanacetum parthenium or feverfew, which we had planted in the herb garden, has bloomed throughout November. And it could be just more or less where I planted it. It could have been that specific plant, or it could just be from seed stock that blooms later. But it's really nice to see its lacy flowers were still up. And, and it was one of those plants that I was like, wow, you know, should I be planting more of this for some late season blooms? But not all of my fever few was in bloom. It was only that one. So I thought I would actually mention it, but give that disclaimer that some of the others were not actually blooming during that time. Though there aren't a ton of blooms on shrubby syncofoil or Dazaphora fruticosa, I'm including it here because it has popped out quite a bit of blooms throughout fall and there are still a few that were hanging on and were visited by pollinators and that are still around here and there even after a frost. Now I've mentioned scabiosa in several videos before, but it's also known as pincushion flower and it is beloved by pollinators and has such a long window of bloom time from anywhere from like early May all the way through November, easily blooms throughout that time. So even though it's a non-native plant, I would definitely recommend it in a pollinator garden, particularly if you want some long bloom seasons. In, like I said, all through November. So it is a, a pretty incredible plant. So I planted some of our calendula in our vegetable garden as companion plants to the vegetables. And I was stunned to see how prolific they were throughout the vegetable garden. So I really should have harvested probably some of the flower heads this season since it's such a powerful herb and I love making salve out of it. I actually ran out of salve that I had made before because my, my dad actually took the last one. He uses it um, for the top of his head and uh, his girlfriend uses it for a scar that she has on her, uh, on her hand. So I love making that salve and I love having a, a bunch on, on stash to be able to you know give to friends and family and stuff like that. But I actually left all the flowers up for the pollinators and they weren't disappointed. I mean, it was filled with like primarily honeybees, but I did also see some of our native bees on them as well. So I went ahead and planted quite a bit of edible and medicinal flowers in the vegetable garden, including borage, which is Borago officinalis. And I had a white and blue version of that. And that was really loved by bumblebees. And like the feverfew, I did not expect the chamomile, the Matricaria recutita, to be blooming, but it was such a strong bloomer throughout the fall, and that was being visited by a number of our native bees as well. I saw some sweat bees and a number of other uh, green metallic bees, things along those lines. So it was pretty cool to see it blooming so late in the season, and it could have very well been that I actually seeded it a little bit later. Oyster leaf was also in our vegetable garden, and this is a genus called Mertensia, and that's the same genus as our native bluebells. I like I use it as our in our vegetable garden because, as its name implies, the leaves actually taste a little bit like oysters, and then the flowers are bright blue, and they tend to bloom a little later in the season, and they are a favorite of bumblebees as well. Next up on the list is Agastaki orantiaca or hummingbird mint. And I really try to collect all different types and cultivars because there are so many good ones. And you'll see they, they range from like, I, I've been collecting more of like the uh, rosy pinks all the way to the deep pinks. And, but they have like yellows and oranges, but I think all of them hummingbirds absolutely love and other pollinators as well. But I think, you know, as the name would imply, they are hummingbird plants and they bloom pretty late into the season and the blooms persist for a long time. So any hummingbirds that are hanging around later in the season will probably enjoy these as a pollinator source. So we just did two videos on mums, one on our sister channel at Plant One On Me 
and one here on the 13 different varieties or classes of mums on flock, but hardy mums can actually be used in the garden. And they don't necessarily have the same compact form as you would typically find at your garden center, but will push out some really beautiful daisy-like flowers super late in the season. And of course you could cut them to keep them pretty compact, but I like, to, I like them to grow kind of wild in our pollinator garden. So I have one that has this kind of nice, rich, orangey, pinkish red color in our pollinator garden. Now I was surprised to see our golden aster, the Chrysopsis mariana, blooming so late in the season in our pollinator garden. And this is one of our specialist pollinator plants, which I've done a whole video on specialist pollinators. So if you wanna know more about that, I'll link to that. And this is a plant that's easily overlooked when designing or thinking about gardens, but one that I personally sought out so that we could see if we can establish the relationship back with some of our specialist pollinators in our pollinator garden. So we've had several cultivars of lavandula or lavender bloom throughout September through November, and we wanted to include it on the list. And you know, some of the lavender was blooming on and off, but the, the pink elegance cultivar happened to be blooming really late in the season and had a really significant bloom time. And again, not quite sure if that's what it's always going to be, or if it's because I had a certain particular plant or if it was planted in a specific area within the garden. But what I recognize is that it was blooming for a significantly long time and the pollinators were loving it up until the point that it stopped flowering. I thought I would put in our hawkweed, which I leave blooming in the lawn and the garden as well if it happens to move in because it puts out some really late season yellow blooms and it seems like the pollinators are attracted to it. So even though it's not really a showy flower, it's one that is reliable for pollinators. So I seeded Boltonia in our meadow and it seemed to have seeded itself in our pollinator garden, which I was totally not upset about. Um, I mean, just look at how many flowers it provides so late in the season. So it was covered in insects and we also had some uh, caterpillars on it that were eating the leaves of the plant. So I was very pleased to actually see that as well because it's uh, acted as a host plant for some of our caterpillars. And finally on my list, I'm going to include creeping thyme. And I did a whole video here on times for pavers or paving stones, but there are ones that tend to have like later or longer blooms. And the ones that we planted in the pollinator garden just on the edge of the garden seem to have no problem blooming late in the season. And it's a flower that I've noticed or inflorescences that I've noticed that pollinators really enjoy. So that's the list that I assembled together this year of late blooming flowers through October and into November. And there are of course more that's blooming in the landscape, but that's just what I'm seeing reliably blooming in our garden this year and hopefully that will give you some inspiration for your cold season gardens. And I just wanna say thank you everyone for tuning into the videos here at Flock. And if you are into what we are doing and producing here, then feel free to show your support. Um, most of you who tune into this channel regularly already know that we give 10% of our Google AdSense and that's reinvested back into community projects here in the region. So even though the channel's only about two years old now, we've been able to give to a local community supported ag program. So that's a CSA program for lower income families. And that supplied um, CSAs for 10 families for the whole year. And then we also provided funding for walkway repair in a community park. So that just goes to show you your support goes a long way in more ways than one. So we thank you. And I guess we'll see you in the next video. Bye.